dropped it. Is that Eichel? Eichel throws the first couple with Erickson X it off. This is what needs to be done with this group. And Jack Eichel is the perfect guy to do it. A tremendous pushback late in the period by the Flames, but it's not enough. Falling behind again. That uh, has been a theme the Flames are trying to change this season. And it went down to the wire here, but the Golden Knights are going to post a 4 2 victory. And the Leafs now without a win in their last six. Welcome into another edition of Our Line Starts with Keith Jones and Mike Milbury. I'm Catherine Tappan. And as we are recording this podcast, breaking news coming out of Toronto that Mike Babcock has been relieved of his coaching duties. Uh, huge announcement as the Leafs have been struggling. They've lost six in a row. The rumors have been swirling. Uh, Mike, not surprising, I guess. But what do you make of this big news? Everybody goes through it. It's uh, a little humble pie for Mike Babcock or a lot of humble pie. He's made his money. I don't think anybody's going to feel bad about where he's going to wind up next or if he decides to just not coach anymore. I mean, he's he's a multimillionaire, and, and, but on the other side of the coin, um, his legacy takes a bit of a hit here. He was supposed to be the answer to what ailed the Toronto Maple Leafs when he came to the Toronto organization. That's failed to materialize. I know the feeling. I mean, I went to Long Island after two great seasons of coaching in Boston thought I could make a difference and uh, personnel problems were too big to overcome and I felt like an idiot and uh, I'm sure he feels a little bit smaller than he did going into today I mean we talked about him having you know confidence in his own ability but what's interesting to me about this announcement is it came from Brendan Shanahan didn't come from the general manager who I think is probably being shielded right now by Brendan Shanahan. I guess Shanahan was the guy that made, basically hired Babcock, correct? Yeah, he was so, really involved in that. So he had sure, to take yeah. the, I guess he had to take the bullet, and Lou Lamarillo was there at the time, I yeah. think. So So maybe that was the right way to go about it, but I think there was some shielding done mm -hmm. of Dubas by Shanahan. And so now in comes Sheldon Keefe. You get some kind of a kick at the can with... A uh, uh, general manager, who apparently they're pretty tight with. We'll see what happens. But it's a, you know, I've always had a lot of respect for Babcock. I mean, he's he's won in a lot of different places. But let's face it, uh, couldn't get Toronto, this team going. Toronto swallows another good guy. Yeah, and he hasn't won a playoff series since 2013, yeah. I believe, Jonesy. He's got a couple years left on this deal, though, too. It's an eight-year deal. Three years still remaining, yeah. so the Leafs are taking a hit financially as well. Yeah, well, they've got the money. They so do. That, that was never going to be the issue there. The issue would be whether or not he could relate his coaching style to the younger superstar talents that are in Toronto right now. Uh, in Detroit, he had veteran players that uh, he seemed to really connect with and put in positions to win games. Uh, that worked well for him there. It worked well for him with the Olympics. I think he does a very good job in managing a team that's got uh, maybe players that are in situations where they're further along in their careers and just didn't seem to get the Maple Leafs to the point that well, I think we all expected them to get to. Even last year in the playoffs against the Boston Bruins, they had the Bruins where they wanted them. Mm -hmm. They they should have won that series, and they didn't. And the Bruins' maturity and the Bruins' star players and leadership and coaching staff, for that matter, I found a way for the Bruins to beat that Leaf team. And I think that has a lot to do with why he's been fired at the start of this year. It was an important start for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And clearly, he couldn't f afford a six-game losing streak at this point. He's without Mitch Marner over the last little while here, too. So you have to think that Kyle Dubas was thinking about this a long time. And finally, that window opened up where he could make a change, get his guy in there, and Sheldon Keefe from the Miners, who they have a great relationship. Maybe he's a little more uh, analytical behind the bench. Maybe it's an old school versus new school type situation. But Kyle Dubas has now got his guy. And now all eyes will be on Kyle Dubas. Yeah, this has to work for it him. It kind of reminds you of what happened in Chicago last year. You fire a legend in Joel Quenville, one of the greatest coaches to ever coach this game, and you bring in your coach from the minor league team for the Chicago Blackhawks and Jeremy Carlton. But, um, you know, you have to look at this, too, and wonder, Mike, how much pressure in the market? I mean, Toronto's the biggest hotbed for hockey in Canada, and this is the team that is 
the iconic Toronto Maple Leafs, and there's a lot of pressure on their general manager to get this figured out. There is, and it's, it has uh, eaten up a lot of other good people. I mean, mm -hmm. Brian Burke as a manager was supposed to be the guy to turn it around. It didn't work for him, and, you know, you had... Randy Carlisle was given a chance. Ron Wilson had a great reputation going into coach. Uh, and now Mike Babcock. So the, the list of casualties is long. Seems like they have the forwards to get the job done. Maybe not enough on the blue line. Goaltending, I'm not 100% well, The starter's okay. very good. They don't have any support for him, though, so they have to play Frederick Anderson a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's no trust in a backup goalie, which is the system that every team's employing now. The two goaltender teams. Do you think they're much better than their record indicates? Yeah, I, I do. I think they're a better team than the. I think they can be one of the more exciting. So what teams do you think? To watch what do you think's court? happened there? Do you think Babcock and Matthews were on the I, same page? Didn't no, look like. No, I, I think that this comes down to the players not performing for the head coach, and I Which think is that a big I think, problem. Yeah, and I think that's why he's been fired. So. And is that an indictment on the players or on the coach? It's a bit of both, but the players are young. I mean, the star players in Toronto are young players, so. You've got to find a way to relate to them and be able to push the right buttons and put them in, in positions and where they're not looking. It is different now, right? It's, it's a lot changed. different now when you you know you got a guy like Nylander holds out to almost Christmas time and he, and he hits the the lottery. Yep. Matthews gets paid. Marner gets paid. Everybody gets paid whether they suck or not. Mm -hmm. Even Jonesy. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Not for this. But Jonesy, you've said, you, we've had this conversation, and you said, if I was making $10 million at yeah. the age of 22 back in the day, I wouldn't have wanted to coach me. I mean, no. there, there's a different sense of mentality with these players these days with the amount of money they're making. It's a big challenge. Yeah. That and can when be tough. you've been with them for an extended period of time, and believe me, he had enough time to get this team to the next level. That was five years that he's been, or four and a half, whatever it is. He's got, I believe, almost three years left on his contract. So that is enough time to figure it out. And in the time that he was being recruited by Buffalo, at the same time as he took the Toronto job, Buffalo's already gone through three head coaches. And you could argue both teams are in similar situations. I mean, they both have young superstar talent. Eichel and uh, Matthews would be the two most comparables. So it is interesting to see how long the ro rope was and understandable because of his past resume for Babcock. But this was a situation that when it happened today, it, it shocked me. Mm -hmm. Even though everything was swirling around, I did not think it would happen during the this season quickly. this year because of everything that Mike Babcock had done. What it tells me is the players had had enough of Mike Babcock. And the players had enough say and enough guys speaking that it ultimately cost Mike Babcock his job. And that's dangerous. Yeah. That's as dangerous as it gets. But those players, the next game and they're the, not the next anywhere. week, you watch them the next week, and if they're flying out there and playing up to their capabilities again, then it'll be the players that had this. And the players are ultimately the reason that Mike Babcock was fired. They should feel responsible for it, and maybe they feel good about it. That's that's going to be. They're not going to say it. It'll be very telling. They'll the tell them games. how they play. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to watch. But if if they do turn it around, under mm -hmm. maybe you give the new coach some credit, but th that does point a finger at Mike Babcock that he wasn't able to motivate mm -hmm. them in the right way, but it also points a finger at the players because they acted like overpaid, spoiled brats. But right. what's, what choice do you have, though, if you you're Brendan if Shanahan you're and you're right. looking at he's, and the one, right. the one advantage having Brendan Shanahan around is he's won cups. He was an awesome player, Hall of Fame talent. He understands the locker room. I mean, he's got all of those elements. So this didn't happen overnight in his eyes. And you can believe it. He had a lot to do with this. And I think he had the utmost respect for Mike Babcock when he was hired in Toronto and had a lot to do with him being hired there. This wouldn't be an easy decision for him. And I do think Kyle Dubas has some say in this, but I think Brendan Shanahan kind of speaks volumes that he was the one who made the announcement. And let's see where Mike Babcock ends up next. That'll be uh, the next starting conversation. Oh, we're going to have... He's going to go fishing. He's, he's going to do whatever he hey, wants. Hey, if I, I would, if I were him, take a little time away. He'll, he'll, be a, he'll be a prime target by many teams, I'm sure. If not by midseason, for sure by season's end when teams start to figure out their next moves if they haven't achieved the level they want. We're going to have Bob McKenzie come on later on in the podcast and talk about this whole situation in Toronto. He's up there. He lives it. He breathes it. So we'll get his take on it. But Calgary, let's shift our attention to what's being called the Toronto West. And it's a Calgary Flames team 
team that has not been performing well lately and strong words from Matthew Kachuk earlier in the week. So let's take a listen to that first. What's the feeling right now in this locker room? I mean, I, I'm sure they're sensing some frustration, but what is the feeling? No, oh, it's, it's disgusting. It's 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 bad. It's bad right now. It's we need to we need to, to change this around. Maybe going home for one game can do this and spark us going into this road trip. But uh, oh, something's got to change here. We we got to get back to uh, to the old us and and get out of this little funk we have here because this is this is not fun. He said that before the team went back home and then lost another game to the Colorado Avalanche, Jonesy. So uh, concerning they play, comments. They, they played better in their, their next loss, but there, there's no question that Matthew Kachuk gets it. He understands how important it is to win with a team like Toronto and Calgary that has great expectations. I would say Calgary's blue line has been better, but they do have some injuries right now. TJ Brody's out, so it's not going to be an easily fixable thing for them right now. But their star players haven't performed uh, to their capabilities and to what they have done in the past. So Bill Peters has a big challenge. He's also from the Mike Babcock tree of coaches. He was an assistant coach with Mike Babcock. I think he's a very good coach. But in Carolina, it didn't work that well for Bill Peters. Uh, Rod Brindamore came in, and all of a sudden, the Carolina Hurricanes, without a ton of changes, are a much improved team. So I would say that there's some pressure on Bill Peters to sort this Calgary Flames team out as well. They have all the elements to be a good team, but they were walked through in the playoffs last year after having a great regular season. Mm -hmm. uh, Colorado just looked like they were miles ahead of Calgary, even though the entire regular season last year would not have told us that. Now Colorado has taken a step forward, and they continue to improve, and Calgary's taken a step back. So they've got to fix it fast there. This season will slip away. What did you think of his comments? That I think he meant to say... Disgusted, not disgusting. <laughs> that's the feel of yeah. the locker room. I, I think he, we'll give him the benefit yeah, of the doubt he, on that one. And I think that's how you feel when you lose. And we've both been involved with many losses. I mean, it's part of the it's part of the job. But there's moments where you're pushed and you you got to get up and you got to get going. You don't and it's hurting and you you know you're struggling personally to try to get your own game going. But at the same time, your personal issues and and lack of production can't carry into what everything else is going on around the team. You have to do your part to make sure you help the team get out of it. But there are tough situations, and leadership becomes that much more important, whether it's the coach or it's the captain or it's the core leaders on the team. you got to find a way to get yourself out of that, and there's only one way to do it, and that's win. Yeah, and, and a big part of it, too, is, I mean, everybody's human. Everybody starts to feel crappy about themselves because they're losing, but you can't let, that's the worst thing you can do is let that creep in. And they, they know they have a pretty good team, but it's tough. I mean, the coach will stay reset, restart, whatever it is, get rid of all that stuff in the background and now refocus on the next game ahead. But as soon as the soft goal, now that, that's not just on the goalie, three or four other things happen before that and the guys that were involved in it are all gonna start to feel crappy about themselves again. It's a, it is really tough to get footing when you're in a rut like that. You, you try anything as the head coach to try to get it? You, you can see when the players' heads are dropping. Yeah. You can see when the, the goal goes in and yeah. it's like, oh, here we go again. Yeah, well, what do you do when you're behind behind the bench watching you, it? You know, you, shuffling the deck makes a difference. Every time you make a line change, mm. that, changes different, that changes people's attitudes. Uh, changing the way, the style that you play, you know, giving it a more... Who gives a damn? Go for it. Let's get in. I, I mean, I always wanted to be our guys to get more aggressive than you know. When you see teams that start to to start to go on these streaks and they start to fall back, they hesitate, and he who hesitates is is lost. And you could start that with you know in practice. When we you talked about it, throw out uh, you know a tennis ball and play with that for a while. Have individual games. I mean, you know. We had a stretch where we couldn't win on Saturday afternoons in Boston, and so I got the guys in early, and I gave them to the assistant coaches, and one guy went for pancakes, and one guy went for a walk in the north end. Anything to change the cycle. And uh, it, it, it doesn't always work, but right. it's where you got you to keep trying. As the coach, you just have to keep trying. And, and you can look at any of the teams that are struggling right now, and there's probably eight or ten of them in the NHL, and all of the comments will be pretty much the same. 
I mean, we can't hang our heads. No one else is going to feel sorry for us. We've got to get ourselves up. They all know the answer to it. Sounds like you've had practice like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I have. But when it's spiraling out of control, it's a really tough yeah. thing. And now they have sports psychologists everywhere. It was a rare thing when I played, and I, I can't imagine you guys had them when you were playing. No, no, we didn't. But now they have them, and that's the reason why. It's to try to get you mentally refocused and reset. And the best players in the game play great four out of five nights. The average guys play great twice out of every five games. Mm. I mean, that's the reality of it. Yeah. But when everybody's starting to go the wrong way at the same time, that's when you've got to either have that come together meeting. In the old days, it would be let's fight. Let's do something to change the momentum. Let's make make, make a difference out there. Whether you got beat up or not, it didn't matter. But that's no longer... Uh, an avenue that uh, coaches are going to go down. So they ha they have challenges. Calgary has a huge challenge now, and so do the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they're both in markets that have great expectations and great fans that love to watch them go. Hey, you mentioned it earlier, too. Like, they've got their money in Toronto, and most everywhere else, they've got their money. Yeah. Uh, I've been saying this, and uh, I guess in seeing it in some smaller fashion, the time is changing in the NHL. It's always been down to earth, regular guys, but, I, you know, how you come into the locker room making $11 million and, you know, you've lost the games? It's really, is that okay? Mike, Would the paycheck get there on time? Mike Milbury, age 22, with. Ten million dollars a year? Are you a different? <sighs> would you be worried about I, I, how I, would I, act? I don't know how people. I mean, a guy like Tom Brady, he's the same all the time. He's yeah. got plenty of dough, uh, but it takes a different special individual yeah, to be that way. But yeah. look where Brady came from, though. He, he was a backup at Michigan. He was a sixth round pick. Yep. It wasn't all handed to him. And some yeah, that's guys, right. That's a good know, point. So some guys are getting it. Not, I would not have wanted to coach me. With a $10 million a year contract, <laughs> it would have been a problem. I wouldn't want to coach you at all. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I don't know what I would have been like. I would hope that You're I would be good, ass, but it would be, like it would be a problem. It would have been a painful <laughs> thing to be a head coach. Well, you were talking about struggling teams, and, I mean, the Buffalo Sabres are struggling as well. They started off strong. Here we go again. It's deja vu all over again. 8-1-1 one one to start the season. Meanwhile, two wins in their last 11. Jack Eichel had this to say in the locker room along the lines of what we've been talking about. Take a listen. No one's feeling sorry for us right now. Uh, we're sure not feeling sorry for ourselves, and, and we can't. Uh, it's, it's, it's too hard of a league. Every night's a test. Um, we have another <laughs> test against arguably one of the best teams in the league on Thursday, so uh, they're definitely not going to feel sorry for us. We just got to work. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to, like I said, it comes down to wanting to win and wanting to win your battle and, and wanting to compete and, and, and really just, you know, giving a shit about, you know, the guy next to you and, um, you know, we just got to find it in here. No one's, no one's going to find it for us other than ourselves. So um, that's all I got. Yeah, it's disappointing because you look at this Sabres team and you really can't understand why this slide is happening right now, Jonesy. But it's very similar to what happened last year. So they know how to get through it. They know what it'll take to change it. So why can't they implement that right yeah, now? Yeah, well, they never really got through it last year. They never really recovered after they had that 10-game winning streak. And then they bumped along really the rest of the season from that point. What's concerning in Buffalo is they've had three coaches since Jack Eichel arrived. So... They've tried different coaches. They've hired and fired. And now they have another guy in Ralph Kruger that looked like he had all the answers when they were winning games. And now they're struggling again. So I appreciate the fact that Jack Eichel's trying to take it upon himself as a leader now on that team to try to change the direction that the team is headed right now. He fought in the last game. And it's out of character for him. But uh, clearly he is upset and feeling a certain amount of responsibility for the way that the team is performing. That's a maturity issue. That's something that's, I think, a real positive for Buffalo and gives me hope that they'll come out of this thing. I think he's talented enough to take over a game. I think he's talented enough to control the pace of the game. And uh, that's a rare quality to have. So I think that they're going to figure it out this year. I feel more confident than I did last year. And it's not about the head coach. I think it's about the maturity of their star player in Jack Eichel, and it's his team. He's got He's got to do it. Uh, you know, this is the same old story in Buffalo, isn't it? I mean, it looked so good. Everybody was singing the happy tune, and all of a sudden, here comes that humble pie again, right? Yeah. It's just, um, and, and in Buffalo, they've had great fans. I mean, supportive fans forever. Um, but they have to start to get antsy after a while. And there's one factor that really compounds 
a losing streak because you hear it from the you hear it from them loud and long after that first mistake and the first goal and that sets you back and you really have to be tough to get through that i don't i i can't figure out the night and day change from the buffalo sabers i just that doesn't make any sense to me it looked like they were playing too damn well to go into this kind of a funk but now that they're in it there's only one thing to do and that's batten down the hatches and somehow find a way to get through it and i i'm with you that's a good sign that Eichel's stepped up, and a couple of years ago, he doesn't do this. Yeah, so I, I would say improved personnel, uh, and I would think the development of some of their younger stars now in a little bit of a different situation, different point in their careers where the, I believe they're capable of getting themselves out of this thing. And they do have a talented hockey team with a deep blue line. And the fact that they have such a good young defense in my eyes, is going to allow them the opportunity to get themselves going. I think it's going to happen relatively quickly. It's kind of long enough for this podcast now since we're Wait. not getting paid at all. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I have another question, though, because you look at Jeff Skinner and the massive contract that he signed, and he was playing with Jack Eichel, and they were dynamic together, but he has since not been playing with Eichel. Um, th there's a little bit of concern around that, Jonesy. I mean, would you put those two back together to try and get this team going? If, if Skinner deserves it, I would. Uh, that that's the big question because Jeff Skinner can be an extremely important player to a team, but when he drifts away and he's not doing the things that Ralph Kruger wants him to do, then he doesn't deserve that opportunity to play with Jack Eichel. So he has to show the head coach that he's going to play the way he has previously, and he was very good last year, but he's got to do it consistently. And there has been holes in his game throughout his career. Uh, when he's been good, when he's been good, he's very good. When he has struggled, he struggles. So he's got to find that consistency, and I'm sure that's what the head coach is looking for. The, the onus certainly is on a player, but it's on a coach. Now, his guy's been fooling around in the soccer world for a number of years. I'm not saying he doesn't know hockey, but he's got to come back to this, this world, and this guy is a core player for this team. He has to get him to work. He's got to get him, and I would, for one, I, I would I would definitely, you know, players pout. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Skinner's pouting, but give him the damn puck with Eichel in the middle. I mean, you know, look at the r record over the last little while. What was it, 1-6-2 right. or was it worse? But if he's, yeah. if he's doing things that are out of what the team's Conversation, is, right? Yeah, yeah have okay. a conversation with a guy. <clears throat> okay, listen, we got to get on the same page here. Mm -hmm. Here's what I need from you, you know? And usually what that is is I need responsible, diligent, defensive work from the red line back. You own from the red line going forward. Well, I'll give you a, the odd blue line turnover because I know you're going to make a good play and we're going to score a goal out of that. But you got to give me this end of the ice because I need that attention to detail. Because, you, you know, you, you may score a goal, but if you're giving up two at the other end, we're in trouble. There's got to be some sort of a deal made with the players. And you've got to trust them with responsible uh, duties and, and give them the freedom to be creative. And, and that's one of the challenges when you've changed coaches as frequently as Buffalo has. Because he, he doesn't have the same cachet with Ralph Kruger. He doesn't, he doesn't know him in the same way. He doesn't know that he can trust him after he has a conversation and the next game he goes out and makes the same mistakes. There's not, a, there's not as much in the bank. Right. And you've got to build up that account with the head coach and that may be part of the issue right now. There's been a lot of change in Buffalo and a lot of it has happened in a short period of time. So I think that may be some uh, short-term bumps for long-term gains. I think that would be my take on that from Ralph Kruger's uh, perspective, just trying to get more out of that player and getting him back to the level that he's capable of playing without doing something that's outside the structure of the team and what he's coaching to the players on that team. It'd be interesting to see if any of these three teams we've been talking about can turn things around. This is a very crucial time in the season. The Thanksgiving break, uh, teams, usually it's a good indication, right, at this point in the year if teams are going to make it or not. Yeah. And, uh, and time to turn things around for these three at least. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some heavy petting going on with other general managers. Just came back from a general manager's meeting. If you're thinking about a coach's change, most, most managers subscribe to the theory that, you know, you owe them at least one change before you drop the hammer on them. And so I think in all those cities, I think that, I mean, there was, a, I think, a ridiculous rumor in Calgary that Goudreau, should, they should entertain offers for Johnny yeah. Goudreau. I <clears throat> put that to bed. Yeah.
Let's, let's, be, let's simmer down with those rumors. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Tuesday night, Marc-Andre Fleury picked up the 450th win, you guys, of his illustrious career. A sure fit going into the Hall of Fame. He became just the seventh goaltender in NHL history to reach that mark. High hopes in Vegas once again. Pierre Maguire actually sat down for a conversation with Golden Knights owner Bill Foley. Great to have Bill Foley, the owner of the Las Vegas Golden Knights. I'll call you second lieutenant Foley because when you graduate from West Point, you're a second lieutenant. But I think you're more than a second lieutenant, are you? Um, well, now I'm a, now I'm a four-star general. <laughs> <laughs> but you did go into the Air Force. No, I went in the Air Force. I flipped to service. I wanted to fly. Uh, so I, I flipped from the Army to the Air, to the Air Force. And then uh, I got in there, and my eyes weren't good enough, so I couldn't fly. So it was like a... I don't know, maybe it was a, maybe it was a godsend because I, I didn't go to Vietnam like a lot of my classmates. And so your title or your rank when you left the Air Force was captain? Captain. So you actually moved up from second lieutenant to captain and you retired as a captain. I retired as a captain and, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to move up, be first lieutenant after 18 months, first a, a captain after 36 months. A lot of guys don't do it, you know, they, they screw up somewhere. So I, actually I did it. I got... Uh, I survived it and I became a captain. You have so much passion about the military academy in particular. What drew you to the military academy? How much time do you have? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I really didn't uh, want to go in the military at all. My dad was in the service. He was, a, he was in the Air Force, mm -hmm. a career Air Force officer. And I, in mid-January of my senior year in high school, I was doing the typical stuff, goofing around, trying to make applications to colleges. And I wasn't doing very well. I mean, I was kind of doing it, you know, handwriting and so on and so forth. And my dad came back from the officer's club and said, well, would you go to a military academy? Would you go to a service academy? I said, I'll never go to the Air Force Academy, because of course he was in the right. Air Force. I'll only go to West Point, because that's where the tough guys were. That's where the, that's where the real men were. And the next thing I knew, I was a fourth alternate. I wasn't a principal. I was, came in late, and I was a fourth alternate. And suddenly, the principal broke his wrist, DQ. The first alternate uh, flunked the mental aptitude test, gone. The second alternate flunked the physical aptitude test, gone. The third alternate flunked the mental aptitude test, and I was in. That's and that's how it, and I had no intention of going. I had no intention of wanting, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want any part of it. So you talked about your dad being a career military guy in the Air Force. That's part of how you find your passion for hockey. He was stationed up in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. He was. And you moved there. And that's where you started with your hockey. Exactly. So I was in third, fourth, and fifth grades, the winter time. And uh, of course, that's all you do is you play hockey, but I didn't know how to do anything when I first got there. So kind of learned how to skate. And we, we lived in, uh, I think it was uh, Rockland. Uh, Just so south of the city. Yeah. South of the city. And there's a canal. So mm -hmm. we skate on the canal. And I did that when I was a, in third grade. And in fourth grade, I got to start playing hockey. And it was just pond hockey. You know, it wasn't really that organized. One of the most amazing things is how quickly hockey caught on in Vegas. I knew they had East Coast League teams here. I knew they had IHL teams here. But it caught on unbelievably. Where was your vision? How did your vision come to this? Well, I really wanted to own a sports team. And, um, but I wanted to make sure the sports team was in a town that I wanted to live in. And would, you know, was, I'm kind of a Westerner, so I wanted to be in the West somewhere. Uh, and uh, the, these, the Maloof brothers had the idea, well, how about hockey in Las Vegas? And I just kind of blew it off. I thought, this will never happen. But I came down, we started getting organized, and I realized that there was a real passion for hockey in this town. And we did our studies, and we discovered there, was a, there were 140,000 avid hockey fans in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we started getting organized. We found the, we, uh, we did the founding 50, which became the founding 75. Each person was supposed to sell 50 tickets. And we went through this ticket drive that uh, the, the league approved. And so we could do that without promising anything. But, you know, Gary and I had, and I had a lot of uh, uh, back channel conversations. So we knew we, we were doing the right thing. And he was, uh, I mean, in four weeks or so, we had 12,000 deposits for a team that didn't exist to play in an arena that hadn't been built. And I knew we had something. It's a fascinating story. Going to the Stanley Cup final the first year, could you ever have imagined that when you first had the idea of bringing hockey here? Not a chance, not a chance. And I, and I, I wish, I frankly, I wish that we had gone to the Stanley Cup last year. And I hope, I certainly hope we go this year because the first year, 
it was such a blur and it was a lot of fun but I didn't really get it you know I did until we were in the moment and we were playing Washington in the finals and we won the first game and then suddenly it was over you know we, we lost and uh, we lost in five and I couldn't believe it what's your favorite part of the game to watch some guys like hitting some guys like speed some guys like offense some guys like defense some guys like goaltending what's Bill Foley like offense I love to watch the offense. I love to watch the guys do the, do the breakaways. I lo love to watch them attack the net. Um, and then I just uh, sort of pray, okay, is our D going to be all right? <laughs> are we, we going to protect, are we going to protect the lead that we have, which we haven't been doing a real good job at lately. One of the most amazing things, I was here the opening night um, when the expansion draft happened. I hosted a party for you folks, and Mark andre Fleury was drafted by your team. What did your scouts tell you when you got Flurry? Did they tell you anything? Well, we had done, a, uh, I mean, we started preparing for the draft in September of the previous year. And we started having meetings with the pro scouts and the amateur scouts were included occasionally, but really the pro scouts. And I feel like in that, in that draft, then when we got into it, we knew more about the other teams than they knew about themselves. Mm -hmm. And Mark uh, Flower actually, became one of our players uh, just before the trade deadline because mm -hmm. we did a, uh, George, I didn't, George did a deal with Pittsburgh and we ended up getting uh, Mark Andre Fleury, if you can believe it, and a second round pick mm -hmm. to take him. Yeah. What a, I mean, what a windfall. <laughs> it was a huge windfall. One of the things you're passionate about besides hockey is the wine business. <laughs> when did that passion start for you? I really got interested in wine in the mid 80s and I was introduced to, uh, white and red burgundies, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay by a, 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 a sommelier. And I said, well, these are, these are great wines. So I, like everything I do, I need to know or think I know everything about it. So I started going to Burgundy and I started going to different domains and I drank a lot of Le Mont Rochers and Poligny Mont Rochers. And I came back and my goal was, if I ever was, were gonna retire, to get in the wine business and make Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays in actually in Santa Barbara County because it's a great place for those two varieties. I don't think people realize how big the Foley family of wines is. How big is it? Uh, we'll do, um, domestically we'll do about 1.5 million cases this year but in internationally in, in, if you throw New Zealand in, New Zealand's going to be about 800,000 cases. So 2.3 million cases of wine. That's a large entity. More than I can drink myself. <laughs> I'm how, pretty good at it. Though. How much time do you spend in New Zealand? I try and go down once a year for about two weeks. So we're going down in January, and we have a, a great we have a lodge that we bought out of bankruptcy about, boy, 10, 11 years ago, and it's it's on Palliser Bay. We have eight kilometers of oceanfront. It's by Martinborough, which is where the Pinot Noir capital of New Zealand, mm -hmm. where Pinot all started. Mm -hmm. And so we go down there, and then we then we get down to central Otago and we kind of go to where our wineries are and, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a great time. I love, I love New Zealand and I love the Kiwis. They're, they're just fantastic people. Kind of like hockey fans. They, they are. No, hockey fans are the same kind of mental makeup and these are just good, hardworking, strong people and you know they like Americans which is pretty good. Does a wine business influence much of your hockey business in terms of the decision making ever? How you see things? No, no, it's totally separate. I'm, mm -hmm. What I did with the hockey team was, because I like to be involved and I really like to be active, I set it up so that George is the president of hockey ops and Kerry Bubolz is the president of business ops. Mm -hmm. And there's no one in between. So I'm in direct communication all the time. I, my office is next to Kelly's and one office away from George. So I try and get in there. I try and watch, watch practice with them. I try and eat with the, eat with the team. Uh, when they're in town for l with lunch every chance I get. Um, I see them after the game if we win. If we don't <laughs> win, I leave them alone. Right. But I, I like to go and congratulate them all and congratulate the coaches. Yep. So I'm a real hands-on active owner. I, I'm, I love it. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things I find fascinating whenever I do a game here is your in-house production. Bill, it's <laughs> phenomenal. It's the best in the league. Thank you. And you play a big part in that. I've seen yeah. you in the helicopter. I've seen you do all these amazing things. That's got to be part of your military training. But who came up with those ideas? It's phenomenal to watch. Well, I, I don't want to be arrogant, 
but those are my ideas. That's fantastic. <laughs> you're not being arrogant. If it's true, you're not being arrogant. I mean, I, I love the, like the whole design of the, the first one we really did was last year after, uh, and we were trying to demonstrate that the sword was stolen by the capitals, mm -hmm. but they had to take it with, it was in a rock, and they couldn't get the sword out of the rock, and we rediscovered where the sword was. We had some guys from Nellis, their pararescue guys, and they were all decked out, and so they discovered, and that's when we came in the helicopter the first time, and this last time, the sharks stole the sword. And so we were in, in, in Montana and we had this little skit, you know, we fly, yeah, we fly in and <laughs> eyes on the prize and then we got, the, we, we have Flower and Carlson and uh, England and I think Schmidt were on. Uh, they looked like cowboys. They were on horseback. Yeah. They didn't do the riding. Oh, we did. We okay. had real wranglers that were, were, <laughs> were riding down the hill, but they looked pretty good. Well, I, the whole thing looks fantastic. When you first came to Vegas with the team in hand, how long did you think it would take before it really caught on? Well, I, I knew we were going to be successful. Uh, I mean, we've done much better than anyone gave us credit for. Mm -hmm. But I always said, and I was serious, playoffs in three, Stanley Cup in six, and that schedule's moved up. So we went to the Stanley Cup in the first year, which mm -hmm. is very fortunate. And um, we should have advanced last year. So now we just got to get our act together this year. And we have a, this is the best team we've ever had of, 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 of talent. And uh, we just got to do a little bit better. So Seattle's coming into the league. <laughs> do you have any advice for them? Well, you know, we don't participate in the draft. <laughs> but we are seriously going to be trying to be very helpful to <laughs> other teams that may have to be exposing someone that they may not want to expose. So right. we're going to be, we're just going to be helpful. And we wish Seattle the very best. You were very um, calculating, not just you, but your whole management team in terms of taking draft picks and young players and everything else during the last expansion draft. Do you agree? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we, we stacked up, we had three first round picks, mm -hmm. two of them have moved on, but we got- Real assets for them, real Patrick, ass Eddie, and Stone. Absolutely, we got yeah. real, real assets and guys that are gonna be players for us for a long, for a long time. Uh, and we still have a lot of draft picks. I think we got s three second rounders next year. Uh, so trade deadline, you know, we've got these picks that something, who knows, something could happen. I know you got a lot of balls in the air. You've got the wine business, you've got the hockey business, you've got the uh, personal business where you own hotels, you own ski resorts and things like that. What's a day like for you? What's a typical day? Because I know you're so hands-on. What's a typical day like for Bill Foley? Well, I'm working a little too hard. I'm actually working harder now than I was working when I was a CEO of a public company. Uh, well, I, I get up late. I don't get up early, but I, my first stop is always down to City National Arena and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe stop in, have breakfast, see what the guys are up to, talk to the, talk to the medical staff. How's everyone doing? How's so-and-so doing if he was hurt? Go up and watch practice, usually have lunch there. Then I jet over to my other office, which is on, uh, in, on 1701 Village Circle, and that's the business office where I mm -hmm. do my, you know, our, our, we do our transactions and so on. So then I'm there, and I try and get out. If, I, if I'm at the point in time in a day where I don't have something to do, I go home. I go home, I'll take a nap, yeah. I'll just take right. it easy. So I try and really pace myself. Uh, and then I think I'm okay, but it, it's a, I'm a little tired. We're you, look on, you look fantastic. We're look, working on a lot of deals right now. I mean, we've got a lot of balls in the air in terms of on the business side. Right, so, right. So. And just the hockey or the wine and everything else? Well, really, we we recently acquired a, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, a, a, a business, record, business yeah. records company, yeah. data company. So we acquired them last February. Had to fix that because it's a distressed company, and we're doing great. And we've just formed a, a capital management company that's investing in other companies. So um, I formed that, just formed that company. Uh, so we're, I'm, I'm, a, well, I'm a multitasker. I, uh, that's but apparent. I, but I don't, uh, I don't micromanage. Uh, I, uh, I, I really let people do their job. I try and be active enough so that if I see that something's not going right with the job being done, then I step in and make a change and then I'll step back. So I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it. I think I do okay well, at it. I think you're really good at it. So. What's a normal holiday day like for you? Can you just divorce yourself from all your assets or do you have to stay involved all the time? No, I'm on the, I'm, we're going to Hawaii over Thanksgiving with the whole family and it's gonna be great. 
But you know, I'll spend a couple hours doing emails or on the phone or talking and trying to keep on pushing things along. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, I'm also been, this New Zealand trip is good though, because there are there are only three hours time difference, but they're a day ahead. Mm -hmm. So you can get down there and suddenly it's it's fr it's Saturday and it's Sunday in New Zealand, but it's Saturday here. It's yeah. Monday there. It's Sunday, so you can actually take some time off. It's pretty good. So I'm going to play a word association game with you, and you just have to <laughs> answer. So when I say San Jose Sharks, what do you think? Mean, nasty, uh, not. Uh, um, I'll be honest. I I just don't respect them. I just think they're kind of a mean, nasty team. When I say the Montreal Canadiens, what do you think? Oh, a lot of respect. One of the original, one of the original six. I mean, just a really strong, good people. I mm -hmm. like them. Mark Andre Fleury. He's he's my hero. He really is. I tell him that. He wins a game. I say you're you're still my hero. And he's so humble. He always writes back, Bill. You know real heroes. Camus. Ah, uh, overrated. That's a wine. <laughs> a cab. The Wagners. Are the Wagners still run? Um, I think they still own Camus. They're very successful people. Yeah. They, they really are. They're, they were my neighbors in Santa Barbara. They had a, a vineyard right next to one of our vineyards. And that's where Mirror de Soleil came, really started right. from. Yeah. Uh, so they're quality. They're, they're smart people. Est-ce que tu parles en français un petit peu? Don't speak French. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Foley, second <laughs> lieutenant, captain, owner of the Vegas Golden Knights and everything else. Bill, I can't thank you enough for doing no, thanks, this. Thank I you so much. It was great having you. That was great. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Great conversation there with Bill Foley and Pierre Maguire. Meanwhile, Bob McKenzie is joining me now for Our Line Starts to talk about the big news of the day, the firing of Toronto Maple Leafs head coach Mike Babcock. Let's hear what team president Brendan Shanahan had to say. Uh, it wasn't an easy conversation to have. It wasn't uh, pleasant. Um, uh, days like today are not, uh, but it was what we felt was uh, important for the club and something once you realize that there's something that you uh, should do and have to do, then it's best to act on it. It really just came down to the last uh, last couple of weeks and uh, it got to the point where you know we, we spoke in the last 48 hours and Again, uh, I just felt that it was something that needed to be done, and, and Kyle felt the same way. So uh, seeing as I had uh, been the one that hired Mike, I thought that it was very important for me to get on a plane this morning and fly here and face Mike and uh, be with Kyle to tell him uh, myself that we had made a, a decision together that uh, we thought was in the best interest of the club. So, Bob, what uh, exactly was around the basis of the timing of this? Why now, and uh, what do you make of it? The timing surprised me a little bit, insofar as the Leafs are in the middle of a road trip. They had that terrible game on Saturday night, and they lost 6-1 to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And they didn't just lose. They, it was as if they rolled over and played dead. And that was the first time you felt like, you know what? Mike Babcock getting fired by the Toronto Maple Leafs might well be inevitable, but we didn't think it would happen then because they were jetting off to Las Vegas. And then they played better against Vegas and lost, and everybody assumed, well, you know what, they're going to play in Arizona on Thursday, Colorado on Saturday. If they're going to fire Mike Babcock, it's more likely to happen when they get back home before they hit Detroit the middle of next week. Um, so the, surprise, the, the, the timing in terms of it being today was a little bit surprising. But this is something that's been speculated on for a while, and, and I, I think those who know Mike Babcock would suggest, you know what, this actually all started the day Lou Lamorello ceased to be the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs and Kyle Dubas took over. Dubas is a new general manager. He's got certain ideas on how the team should play, how a team should be constructed, and Mike Babcock definitely has ideas on how a team should be coached and how it should play. And I'm not sure the two were fully on the same page, although I think they both gave it the old college try to try and make it happen. The Leaf season is spiraling out of control. They are very close to being totally out of it. They've not played well. They played more games than almost any team in the National Hockey League, and their point percentage is right amongst the very worst in the Eastern Conference. They're in real danger of not making the playoffs, and I think that ultimately was why Brendan Shanahan flew from Toronto to Arizona Arizona today with Kyle Dubas and told Mike Babcock, you're gone. And Sheldon Keefe, a guy who is more simpatico with Kyle Dubas, 
is now the new head coach. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of reading between the lines here with what you're saying. I mean, is there a bit of a was there a bit of a rift between Kyle Dubas and Mike Babcock, a philosophical rift? Yeah, I, I think that I think that's fair to say. And as I said, listen, I don't believe you know. There's a lot of Leaf fans thought the year started out and they're saying, you know what, um, Babcock's on a really short leash. Dubas is going to look for the very first chance he's got to fire him. And I don't believe that's the case because I think organizationally, even quite aside from Kyle Dubas, I mean, there's more than six million reasons a year why you don't want to fire Mike Babcock. He's got three more years on his contract after this season. He's going to make over six million dollars per year in each of those years. So that's a lot of money to be paying a guy you don't want to coach your team, but it is the Toronto Maple Leafs and they've got a money-making machine, yeah. a money-printing machine in the basement. Um, so, yeah, were they on the same page? I think they tried to be. I don't know that they necessarily were. I can tell you this, that Kyle Dubas and, and Sheldon Keefe, the new head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs, who has no NHL coaching experience, none whatsoever, never been a head coach, never been an assistant coach in the National Hockey League, uh, and yet has been ultra successful with the American League Marlies um, and coached for Dubas in junior in Sault Ste. Marie. They are like-minded in terms of how the game is played. Mm -hmm. Speed, offense, quick transition, don't spend time in your own end. And Babcock, of course, was a defense first guy. And a lot of people think that the problems were rooted because Babcock was trying to coach a skill and speed team to be the one nothing 2-1 shutdown team that they weren't. And Babcock and his, his camp would suggest, you know what, the way this team's constructed, it's not, a, it's not a formula to win in the National Hockey League, especially when we've seen St. Louis and Washington win the Stanley Cup with a real heavy game to go with the speed and skill. Mm -hmm. So Jonesy earlier in the podcast was talking about how the players more than likely stopped playing for Mike Babcock, that this is probably where this really reached a boiling point where it was time for Babcock to go. How much blame do you put on the Austin Matthews, the Mitch Marners, the Nylanders of this group, the superstars that are making a lot of money not playing that system right now? Well, there's, I think there's a huge shared responsibility. You know, you know, Kyle Dubas didn't give Mike Babcock a very good backup goaltender to work with. Now, Mike Babcock's got a manner in which he coaches backup goaltenders and his utilization of backup goaltenders, it sets the bar up here for a backup goaltender as opposed to most teams will just spot a guy in here. Mike Babcock basically only plays his, his backup on the second half of back-to-backs and Freddie Anderson gets the easier first night against softer competition and the backup gets the higher, harder second game. So that was an issue. So, so Dubas has, has got some criticism here. Um, and the players, most certainly, they have not played well. Uh, Austin Matthews has ridiculous numbers. Very good. Like, he's on pace for 50-plus goals. Before Mitch Marner was sidelined with his high ankle sprain, he was on pace for 100-plus points. And in Toronto, people are looking at them and saying, they're not playing very well. Very inconsistent. And the team did not play very good defense for Mike Babcock. And again, some people who support Mike Babcock would say, it's not a very good defense. They didn't give him enough to work with. But the players absolutely take responsibility here. And, and honestly... I mean, I don't think the players love Mike Babcock, um, but people would say the players didn't love Scotty Bowman either mm -hmm. when they played. They loved him when they were lifting the Stanley Cup. Um, and in this instance, players are different today, maybe. Um, I think it, it's harder to coach younger players today um, if you're using the old school values that Mike Babcock would put a premium on. So I, I think there's plenty of blame to go around, and obviously Babcock too. Um, had an opportunity with a pretty good hockey team, and he wasn't able to build on what they did last year. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the pressure of coaching a, a young team loaded with talent, but also the pressure of coaching in Toronto. And I know if it's one guy that could do it, it would be Mike Babcock with the experience he has and the, the pedigree he has. But, you know, Bob, I'm curious. Like, I mean, you live up there. I, I was up there working for a number of years. and It is a different beast up there when you're talking about hockey and the Toronto Maple Leafs. What is the mood right now around what happened, the, 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 the reaction to the firing? Uh, and also, how much did that city and, and the response of the media and the attention and the scrutiny that the organization was getting come into play here. I, I don't think it. I don't think that the fan reaction and general level of dissatisfaction with the hockey club, which is very high right now, I don't think that was a factor. I really think what the factor was is they saw the Leafs playing all these games and their point percentage totals being just horrendous. And they're thinking to themselves, we're going to miss the playoffs mm -hmm. this year. And I think that's why this happened on this particular day, because they're looking at Thursday night against Arizona and Saturday night against Colorado and saying, 
we got, we got to do something here because if we don't do something, if we don't get a response quickly from our players, we're not going to make the playoffs, and that's unacceptable. In terms of the marketplace, um, you know, a few years ago, the Leafs made the playoffs, and everybody was like, yeah, because it had been so long, and they, people were excited. And they met Washington in the first round, and they played extremely well against the Washington Capitals, lost in six games or whatever it was. But everybody was like, that's it. They're on their way. Matthews, Marner, Nylander, all these great young players. And then... Two years ago, they had another great season. They had an be even better regular season, and they lost in Game 7 to the Boston Bruins. But that was okay because people could rationalize it and say, ah, oh, yeah, but you know what? That's not going to happen every year. We're going to get yeah. better. We're going to get – it's going to be so much better when these players mature and, and we're on our way and we're going to be a contender now. And then they, the, this is where management made a big decision. Signed John Tavares to his $11 million contract. That accelerated the plan in terms of we're not waiting for Marner Matthews and Nylander to be 25 before we're ready to contend. We're bringing Tavares in and we're ready to go now. And bringing him in at $11 million, Marner, Matthews, those guys, they're looking at it and saying, hmm, $11 million for him. We're the young players on this team, homegrown talent. We want that kind of money too. And that created a cap crunch. So that, quite aside from that, but the fans' expectation after last year when they lost again in Game 7 in a 100-plus point season, that's where bitter disappointment came in. And then when Marner asked for big money and got it this summer, when Matthews got his big contract last summer, Tavares has got his big contract, Nylander got his big contract, and the fans in Toronto were like, OK, enough with the Game 7 losses to the Bruins, enough with... 100-point seasons and going out in the first round of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Enough with Mike Babcock. When was the last time you won a playoff round, bud? Yeah. Um, enough really with Kyle Dubas. Hey, you're a new general manager. You know, why is our defense not good enough? So suddenly a market that had been pretty passive in terms of criticism or holding them to a high standard suddenly got a little owly and a little squirrely. And this season, I mean, right from the get-go, they haven't been very good. And their power play's terrible and their defense is terrible. Um, and the fans are letting them hear about it every day. So, yeah, it's a pretty negative atmosphere in Toronto right now. All right. Well, we'll see what Sheldon Keith can do with this group, and we'll have to pay attention to those games this weekend. Arizona, Colorado, the road ahead for the... Uh, the, the... Yeah, I did. They came in with a big bag of money. <laughs> Mike Milbury just asking if I'm getting paid. Of course I am. I lost my amateur you get status paid a long time ago. Mike does not. They said, you, Mike doesn't uh, get paid, but you do, so... <laughs> Well, we're happy you joined us, paid or unpaid, whatever it will be. We'll keep that a mystery. Thanks, Bob. And yeah. thanks to everyone for tuning in to another episode of Our Line Starts. You can subscribe for automatic downloads wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be happy to see you next time.